This is Hannibal here from the HannibalTV.com, live with none other than Sir Mo from Men on a Mission, who since WWE has now got into not only the wrestling training business, but also the wrestling promoting business. How are you doing today, sir? Hey, Mo? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me to your event tonight. Do you want to tell people a little bit about what you're doing these days? Well, uh, tonight we're in Dallas, Texas at the uh, Elks Lodge. Soul Championship Wrestling is uh, one of three different promotions that uh, I produce, along with CKW, KI Championship Wrestling, and Little Rock, Arkansas, and Southern Extreme Wrestling in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, tonight at Dallas Elks Lodge, uh, bell time 7.30 p.m., uh, just our normal monthly show that we've been doing here at this location about five years, and uh, we're excited to uh, to be able to continue to do this. Now, when you uh, left WWE, did you get right into training people, or did you do uh, other stuff? So initially, when I left WWE, the plan was to um, wait a ninety day. Um, no compete clause out and then go to WCW. But uh, the day before the 90 day clause ran out, Scott Hall and Kevin Nash showed up in WCW and all of those plans to go there were a wash. That's right. Cause I remember a rumor that at one point it was going to be Mabel. That secret. was going to be the other NWO member. Yeah. Uh, I never had conversations. I never had conversations with uh, anyone there. Everything was uh, through Nelson, but apparently uh, the the idea was to go there, and then that fell apart. And then once that fell apart, uh, I started uh, training people. The rest. I see. And how did you yourself get started in the business? Uh, um, Gene Anderson, the Minnesota Red Crew, had school. Uh, there in Monroe, North Carolina, and uh, I met him at an indie show, and uh, I joined the school. That was the summer of 1990, and uh, then I met Nelson uh, King Mabel about mm, two months later, and I guess the rest, as you know, between he and I and the men on the mission characters is history. How did Gene Anderson treat you? Because he's a bit of a controversial character. Well, Gene, Gene was tough, man. Uh Gene was tough, no nonsense. Uh, Gene felt like uh, if you could take a bump on the concrete floor, you could take a bump anywhere. And uh, we literally had to do that a few times. And uh, his training method was uh, kind of hard, but it was no nonsense. And, and if you weren't dedicated to it, he wouldn't waste his time. Did he ever stretch you? No. Uh, I, I think at that time, Gene's health was so poor that, you know, most of his students at the time did the training. He didn't He didn't do anything inside the ring. Now, Jacques Rougeau was one of my trainers. What was it like working with the Quebecers in WWE? Oh, I, I, man, I learned so much working with Jacques and Pierre, man. I, you know, in fact, in fact, I spoke with Carl like three weeks ago. We're still uh, pretty tight. Uh, Jacques and uh, Nelson had a a uh, really tight friendship because they would gamble with each other all the time. So it, it made for fun road trips with uh, Jock and Pierre. How was the uh, backstage politics back in those days? Because we always hear the click was uh, running rampant. Well, they, you know, they, they, I only had issue. I only had issues with the click or one member of the clique, Shawn Michaels, one time. But other than that, man, they never really, they never really bothered myself and Nelson. Uh, I remember when they had issues with Jacob and Eli Blue. Uh, I remember when they had issues with uh, Shane Douglas. But as far as Nelson, I had that one incident with Shawn Michaels where he and I almost got into a fight. But other than that, I didn't have any problems. I got to ask you about that incident since you bring it up. What happened there? Well, so it's, it's, it's funny because I didn't, I didn't understand until a few years ago exactly where Shawn Michaels was coming from. But on this particular night, we were in Israel. Nelson got sick, 
And uh, so they sent him back to the hotel. And so instead of being able to work a tag match with the uh, head shrinkers, uh, myself and Samu had to work a singles match. Well, Fatu was upset. Shawn Michaels was pissed off because he felt like Nelson should have, at the very least, walked down to the ring, stood ringside, and we still have a tag match. You know, that way, back in the day, if you didn't work, you didn't get paid. So everybody earned the payoff that night. And he came out of the shower. We were standing there in the dressing room and basically assaulted me. And uh, we had words. I basically threatened to kick his ass if he ever touched me again. So that, that, that basically is what happened. I ended up getting, I guess, starred for nine months is what they call it. And uh, then right after that, Nelson and I went to a little short program with Sean and Kevin Nash. But all of that stuff, I was so pissed off about all that stuff. I didn't even realize that a year after it happened, it was over. Now, Oscar was your manager. Is it true they just basically found him in the crowd? Uh, well, actually what happened was it was WrestleMania 9 at Las Vegas. Oscar's a freestyle rapper, and he was doing the opening act for Andrew Dice Clay. He met Vince McMahon, Jerry the King Law, and Macho Man Randy Savage uh, when they were doing WrestleMania uh, 9 at Caesars Palace. He met him in the elevator, and he did a freestyle rap for him. And that's how they discovered Oscar. I see. Did he have any uh, heat or ribs played on him ever since he wasn't really uh, uh, they, they They physically abused Oscar. One time uh, on his birthday in Florida, they, they beat him with some type of board or something. And they beat him really bad. And then one time, I think we were in Michigan or Wisconsin or something. They all taped him to the urinal ripped his clothes off and covered him with shave, shaving cream or, or or something like that. But, yeah, they they, they pretty <laughs> abused him. Yeah, they, they, who, they abused him. Who found him when he was taped to the earth? Well, Nelson, Nelson and I, you know, found him. But they they, they abused him uh, that night. They, they – I think they did everything, man. I think they pissed on him, covered him with shaving cream, just – they had him taped to that urinal, man, closed down. Just, but, you know, he was, you know, the beautiful thing about Oscar was he would just shake that stuff off and laugh it off and he wouldn't make waves. He just, okay. He knew that he was in a hostile environment. And is it true that there was uh, an original nation of domination in the USWA that you were a part of? There was, there, there was a version of that. I don't know. I, I wouldn't be the person to say that it was the original version, but I know that Jamie and, and Wolfie D of PG-13 were part of the original version. And so they were also part of the version in Memphis, along with myself, Tracy Smothers, uh, Reggie B. Fine, uh, uh, Miss Texas or Miss Jacqueline was a part of it. It's Queen Moesha. So, uh, yeah, I was part of that version. I don't know if that was the original version, but I was a part of that. Reggie B. Fine is an interesting character. Uh, are you still friends with him? I, I actually just saw Reggie about four weeks ago at a show in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, Reggie is, um, well, you, 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 you did an interview with Reggie, so you know how Reggie is. Yeah, I, I, I actually like him, but he's a controversial guy, to say the least. He's very controversial. When they brought uh, Nelson back in his viscera, was there ever any talk of bringing you in? You know what? When I left there in 1996, after um, suffering depression and a, a suicide attempt, I told myself I would never go back. So I never attempted to go back. Uh, when, Nelson, when Nelson went back... Um, there, there was a discussion between, from from what I'm told, this is hearsay, but from what I'm told about another talent's wife who I was best friends with, that there was a discussion between Vince and one of the top talent uh, about bringing them back, and and that top talent said to Vince, if if it helps the company, then I'm okay with it, you know what I mean, but I won't work. And so they brought him in. He did the thing with Ken Shamrock. That was like that King of the Ring thing. Uh, and uh, everything went well. And so they brought him back. And I'm glad he was able to go back and 
get another opportunity. What were your thoughts when he unfortunately passed away suddenly? It was crazy, man, because I had just talked to him the night before. And uh, we just had a conversation about there was a lot of stuff that we had done that that we still needed to do, that we still needed to prove to people that we were one of the best tag teams in the business, you know. And um, that's why I try to keep his name alive right now. One of the things about I, I, I really don't like to do podcasts, but this is one that I really wanted to do because I wanted to set the record straight on a couple of things. Number one. Uh, I learned a lot from that incident with Shawn Michaels, and uh, I was pissed off at him for a long time because I didn't understand, but I learned from it. And I and what I learned from it helps me teach my students today, helps me be a better coach. But number two, Nelson Frazier was probably one of the most talented big men in the business. And the only thing people talk about is three or four people that got hurt in the ring when they was wrestling against Nelson. Now, what they don't talk about is that Nelson at the time was 18, 19, 20-year-old kid that nobody took under their ring, their their arm to mentor. No, other than wrestling training, you know, him him and I, after Gene passed away, working out with each other, we never had mentors. So nobody ever said, hey, kid, come here and let me teach you this. Hey, kid, if this situation right here happens, here's how you – you know, deal with that. He, he never got that, you know, and, you know, so people, the only thing they want to remember about Nelson is that he hurt people. Yeah. You know, he hurt four or five people, you know what I mean? But th- that doesn't describe the talented person he was or the decent person that he was. The guy, the guy was a beautiful person. Uh, he was young. Everybody in this business has hurt somebody at one point in time. You know what I mean? And uh, I just don't want his legacy and people that come now. The only thing that they hear is, yeah, I heard I he heard a bunch of people. No, he heard five people in the span of having a job up there eight, nine years. I mean, five people in eight or nine years. I've seen where Vader's hurt five people in a year working at WCW. So, you know, it might piss people off, but, you know, no, Nelson was a great person. And Ahmed Johnson probably hurt a lot more people than that, too. I, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that uh, Men on a Mission will ever be in the WWE Hall of Fame? I, I think that uh, I think that Nelson died last conversation we had. I think that Nelson died wanting that to happen. Uh, I don't know with today's uh, atmosphere, with politics or – what I think we deserve it because, you know, uh, there's a lot of people in the Hall of Fame for whatever reason, you know. But we we did do something. We did do something legendary, being the second Black African American tag team to win those WWF tag team belts. That in itself uh, should be enough. Now you became Sir Mo when, of course, it was King Mabel. Any thoughts on that gimmick transformation? Uh, you know, I I, en- I enjoy the whole being able to dress up and go ringside and be a manager. I, I wish that they had given me more speaking parts uh, because I, I I'm a really good speaker, but uh, I enjoy that, and uh, that's why I keep the name today. I I've used that name since they gave it to me, and, and still today. 30 years being in the business, I still use that name. Did they ever do anything about that fan that hit Mabel with the trash at the King of the Ring? No, you know, I actually, you know, it was just, we we loved it because we felt like when we got pummeled with all that trash at the King of the Ring 95, we felt like, man, now this is some real heat. You know what I mean? Because we hadn't seen anybody in a long time just get pelted with trash and garbage from the fan. I don't know if it was because they hated us that much or if they hated the fact that Nelson won the King of the Ring. But in either case, we pissed the world off and we were enjoying it. What advice would you give uh, heels out there watching as a trainer for, for being a heel? Honestly, man, I would say be aggressive. Uh, don't waste time yelling and screaming at fans. Piss them off by the work that you do in the ring. 
You don't have to stay. I mean, it's easy to yell at somebody and cuss them out and they yell back at you and, and call you an asshole or something. But when you can have somebody on the front row want to climb that rail and come in there and kill you because you're killing their hero in the ring, that's when you're doing a great job as a heel. Did you have much interaction with Sonny backstage? <laughs> uh, me interaction with Sonny. I'll say this. The last time Sonny and I had a conversation, because I was the first person that knew about Sonny and Shawn Michaels' relationship. The last time Sonny and I had a conversation, Sonny said, bro, you know you could have been the Intercontinental Champion. You could have had any belt you wanted to if you had just used the fact that me and, me and Sean were sneaking behind everybody's back. Yeah, I had conversations with her. I had interaction with her. I knew about her and Shawn Michaels long before anybody else other than the click. How did you know? Do well, I because <laughs> I, I walked in on them several times, and uh, <laughs> I walked in on them several times, and I remember there was one time in San Jose um, where Chris Candido, uh, Just Incredible, and uh, somebody else were sitting in the lobby with Sonny, uh, and I was at, I was in my hotel room. The back, it was like a balcony circle. Uh, in San Jose, and I was on the balcony in my room, and across the way on the other side was uh, Shawn Michaels' room, uh, Kevin Nash's room was right across, and I sat there, and I watched Sonny leave the table with Chris Candido, get on the elevator, go upstairs, and sneak in the Shawn Michaels' room, and him look across there at me and go, and I'm like, no, nah, I didn't see it, but I, I saw a whole lot of their stuff, man. So it, it was just, uh, I I saw that stuff and I, I, I probably could have snitched it off because many times I sat with Chris as he was heartbroken, you know, because I, you know, I was, I was a lot of free time and I sat with Chris many times. He was heartbroken over what was going on, but I, I just, it, I, I couldn't bring myself to tell him what was going on. So, <laughs> yeah, it's unfortunate. Some people say that he he actually knew about it and liked it, but you're saying that he probably wasn't happy about I, it. I, I, you know, I, I know he was. I know he was unhappy and he was upset. I can't say with a hundred percent certainty that he knew about it at the time that I knew about it uh, because it was fresh and it was brand new. But I, I remember many days when he sat around and. He was upset, but I can't imagine Chris knowing about it and was just okay with it. There's a fan on here that wants to know if you have any memories of the WrestleMania 10 European tour the week after. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was, I think that was, I want to say that, that was the, the first time I'd ever gone overseas. And uh, it's crazy, man, because when you land at the airport, the fans are there. And they follow you all. I mean, we're talking about from one city to the next city. It's like eight hours. And it's the same fan caravan and following the bus. You have heels on one bus and baby faces on another bus. And those fans are, it's like the Beatles when, when WWF come to town. The fans are just crazy. And they follow you from town to town. I enjoy them European tours. Now, what does SOAR actually stand for, the uh, the initials of your company? S-O-A-R. So uh, the, the creator, Denise Jones, uh, she's a Marine. And we would always – and I was in the United States Army, so we would always have these conversations about which branch of the service was the best. And, and of course, you know, you, you ask many people, and they'd say the Marine Corps. And so she came up with the – you know, the Marine Corps always stands out above the rest. And that's where that S-O-A-R came from. Uh, she created it. There's a fan on here that wants to know what city had the best food when you were touring. <laughs> what city had the best food? You know what? It was the first time I'd ever tried it, but I thought it was great. Providence, Rhode Island. I went to this Chinese restaurant, and it was the first time I'd had the cottage, the uh, cottage cheese rang, rangoon, whatever they call those crispy things with the cottage cheese. Yeah, 
uh, it was I I fell in love with those things. And then the last time that I was there, which was the night the Undertaker got his uh, orbital bone broken, I had some and the cot and the cheese cream cheese is what it was. The the cream cheese was bad, and and I got sick. And what used to be my favorite food, I can't even eat it now. Did you get along well with the Undertaker? Oh, me and me and Mark was real tight. <laughs> me and Mark was very tight, very very tight. What what would people be surprised to know about him? About Mark? Yeah, he's just a normal human being. He's just a normal human being. There's a fan that wants to know how you liked working with Raven when he was Johnny Polo, managing the Quebecers. Oh, Scotty! Scotty was a yeah. lot of fun. We we actually came to WWF the night Nelson and I tried out. Me, Nelson, and uh, Johnny Polo actually rode in the same rental car, flew on the same plane for a tryout that night together. We all came over from Memphis together. So uh, Johnny Polo was cool. Scott Levy. Did you travel with Oscar and Mo, or did you travel? Oscar Mabel. Yeah, or sorry, Ma Mabel. Ma yeah. Mabel, me and Mabel lived in the same house. So we, we traveled everywhere together. Every now and then, Oscar would ride with us. But Oscar, being the rapper that he was and had, had traveled in so many places, he had friends in just about every city. So he pretty much traveled by himself. Is there any reason why you never appeared in a WWE video game? I would say this. In 1996, at the Royal Rumble, Nelson and I quit that night and went home, asked for our release. Now, I don't know if I got heat from the company for doing that or not. I don't know. But I, I, I've, I've never been denied tickets or anything like that. But I've never been asked to do uh, anything like video games or anything. But also, I've never asked to do anything or ever tried to – uh, to attempt to go back and get work there because my experience there when I almost committed suicide was so bad that I didn't want to be uh, tied to a contract uh, and, and and not be able to just do what I wanted to do. So, Did you actually attempt to uh, kill yourself or you just had the suicidal thoughts? Uh, you know, it was I was on the last beer with the 9mm cock to my head and my girlfriend come running out of the apartment because her dog ran away. And I thought to myself, if we don't find this dog, she's going to kill me. And so, <laughs> so it took us three hours to find that dog. And by the time we found that dog, I tell people all the time, a dog saved my life. But by the time we found that dog, I realized that there was, you know, much worse things in life than not being able to wrestle. So that was the end of that talk. Any memories of your team doing could going up against Team Bigelow, which everyone remembers? Man, that was that was that was an unexpected surprise. We didn't even know we was on the pay per view until we got there, and they sent us the makeup. And uh, so we just tried to make that the funnest, goofiest match we could possibly do. And uh, the only thing I regret is that they didn't give me a better scooter to ride. Gary Nation on here, I guess you must know him. He says, can I ask you about the night in Sam's Town where Kamala was supposed to wrestle Lord Humongous and Kamala left without saying anything and you had to put this guy in there with him instead? Do you remember that? I have no clue. <laughs> I, I, know, I know who Gary is. Uh, I, I have no clue what happened. I have no clue. Any memories of your famous uh, moonsault at, in your house, too? I I remember Nelson and I, uh, Nashville was our hometown. And I remember Nelson and I said that, you know, this is probably going to be the last pay-per-view that we get to wrestle with each other together. So let's just do the craziest thing that we've never tried to do. And so I decided I'd do the moonsault, and he took the big flare bump off the top rope. So... That, <laughs> I was afraid, but it was like, okay, I'm going to kill myself trying this, but I did it. How did you get along with Bret Hart backstage? Backstage? Yeah. Uh, to this very day, me and Bret Hart are really good friends. 
to this very day. In fact, I messaged him. <laughs> I messaged him the other day on March the twenty third, two months early, saying, "Man, uh, I really miss Owen today." You know, what I'm saying it would have been X number of years uh, this year, and and he messaged me back. He said, "Man, I appreciate it. I love that man, but you're about two months too early." I said, "Ah, oh, man, I'm I'm so sorry. That's that's crazy." Did you and uh, Mabel ever go to the recording studio with Oscar? No. If you could change one thing about your career, would you have done anything differently? If I could change one thing about my career, I would have I would have sat down after that incident with Shawn Michaels and thought the whole thing through, and I wouldn't have gave up so easily on uh, on everything. Uh, I, uh, I I pretty much when that happened just gave up on wrestling, but if I, if I could go back and change anything, I'd change that incident. And where can fans follow you if they want to look you up online? Uh, Bobby Horn on Facebook, uh, the original Sermo on Instagram, and uh, Sermo WWE Superstar on Twitter. Very good. There's uh, one last fan question I'll ask because it's interesting. Do you have? Did you have any interactions with Bill Watts when he was in WWE for a while there? <laughs> Somebody's trying to set me up. They know I don't. I don't like Bill Watts. I ask. Yes, I had. I. I, I here, here's the thing. We got up that morning. We were in Detroit. Oscar and Nelson ribbed me by leaving my bag in the parking lot. We drove down to somewhere in Michigan. It was like three hours away. We get to the town. And my bag's not in the rental car. I had to get in the car, drive back to Detroit, get my bag, and then drive back to the building. So I missed my television match that night. And then they were going to go over uh, a finish with Kevin Nash and Diesel. And as I was walking in the room with, with the group, Bill Watts, who was booking that time, says, nah, he don't need to be in the room. Uh, he's not part of this. He's expendable, so we can do this without him. And I, I wanted to look at him and say, you cocksucker, I can't fucking, and I just turned my back, walked away. I went to J.J. Dillon and said, I can't believe that he, you know, talked to me like that. I, I really want to go in there and punch him in his face. And, and J.J. just said, just calm down. Uh, next time you see Vince, just explain to Vince that he talked to you like that. And that was that was it. But I, I couldn't stand Bill Watts. <laughs> I couldn't. Luckily, he didn't last there. Thank very God. Long. Thank God. I'm glad he didn't get hit by that truck. Well, very good. I appreciate uh, you talking to me. Hopefully, we can do another one yeah. when you're not so rushed sometime. But good <laughs> luck on your show tonight, Soar. And people can – how often do you run here in Dallas? We're, we're at the Dallas Elks Lodge every first Saturday of the month. Uh, every third Saturday, we're at Chaotic Kingdom Wrestling in Sherwood, Arkansas, and every – Fourth Saturday, we're somewhere around Memphis, Tennessee, or Fall City, Arkansas, with Southern Extreme Wrestling. All three of those promotions are part of the OIWA, which I founded in 2020. And if they want to join the school, where can they look up information? BobsonBruisesPro.com. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching for the Hannibal TV. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and click.